Oh, big shock. Charizard won the EYC. Giratina still doing well. Pidgeot, another Charizard, some Iron Hands. That's pretty cool, at least. Hang on. What are you doing here? That's right. An inventive new build of Roaring Moon managed to earn Mark Hostrup a cool $7,000 at the EYC, the first post-rotation tournament, thanks to his top eight placement. And it's all thanks to two brand new cards from Temporal Forces, rebranding Roaring Moon from being an all-out aggressive two-prize racing deck into a more tactical predominantly single prize build with explosive potential from the EX when required. Let's talk about the deck's new introductions. A new Roaring Moon from Tempora Forces becomes a fantastic single prize beat stick in the deck. 140 hit points, which can be buffed even further with Ancient Boost Energy Capsule all the way up to 200, is a very bulky single prizer with a very efficient Vengeance Fletching attack for two Darkness Energy, dealing 70 plus 10 more for each Ancient card in our discard pile. Now there's also the face of Ancient Box, where you fill your deck with almost 30 Ancient cards to really push this Vengeance Fletching, but in this list we're stripping it back to just the core essential Ancient cards within the list, so the Vengeance Fletching is mostly going to be used to deal with other single prize Pokemon, and we will be able to reach into base sick two prize Pokemon requ when required as well. Meaning that the higher damage output that we look towards is still going to be coming from the form of Frenzy Gouging from Roaring Moon EX. The other new part of the deck is the Dunsparce. This is the draw engine of the deck, and really what makes the deck tick. The Dunsparce has the runaway draw ability. Once during our turn, we can draw three cards, then shuffle the Dunsparce and all cards attached back into our deck. Both of our ancient supporters, Sada and Explorer's Guidance, helps us grow hand sizes throughout the game. So the guaranteed three card draw from every Dunsparce use can be a lot more useful throughout the mid game than a Bibarel might offer us, which is only really going to be there for Iona protection, but we can still make that happen with the Dunsparce regardless. The other really important fact to note is that the Dunsparce is effectively a free retreat Pokemon because we can use its ability from the active position. And it's actually really important for us to have a pivot in the deck list because as well as Sada's Vitality, we are going to be utilizing Dark Patch as our means of energy accelerating. With that said, Dunsparce also has free retreat from this set, so we're constantly giving ourselves a pivot to allow our dark patch to function throughout the game. Because we're utilizing this engine rather than other engine Pokemon, it means we don't actually need to commit space to pivoting cards when we are coming up against the control and stalling matchups, because we can constantly force our Dunsparce back into the deck when we have to. Taking a closer look at the decklist itself then, I am not making any changes from the EYC 60. I think it was a very well constructed list. We are maximizing the counts of our single prize Roaring Moon because this is going to be a card that you use throughout the entire game and you really only pick your opportunities to use your Roaring Moon EX when you need to have that big burst of damage to clear out higher hit point threats. With Sada's Vitality and Dark Patch, you can burst a Roaring Moon EX into play quite happily in one turn. We play a 3-3 line of the Dudon Sparse. We play three copies of the Artisan as well, which synergizes so nicely with the deck. It allows us to loop Baby Moons as an attacking threat, but also allows us to re-establish Dunsparce after you've done the Runaway Draw. You can immediately Artisan back a Dunsparce for that guaranteed pivot and allowing you to get reuse out of it throughout the entire game. Some extra draw coming in from Radiant Greninja, and this has great synergy with Pitching Dark Energy, which is still a key component of the archetype because we want to use the Dark Patches, but also the Sada's Vitality as a crucial draw supporter in the deck. The Explorer's Guidance isn't the best supporter card, but it is an ancient supporter, so it is still helping us with that Vengeance Fletching, and it is still throwing away a lot of resources that we don't necessarily need to do, so we are digging through the deck quite aggressively. We have the Super Rod in the deck list anyway, so we can reload any dunce pieces or anything else that hits the discard pile too early. And there aren't too many other cards that we don't mind seeing hit the discard pile. The Ancient Boosters, again, help with that Ancient Tally that we have in the deck, but also help push the hit points of our two main attacking Pokemon. You'll notice there's only one copy of Boss's Orders, but we are supplementing that with a counter catcher as well as a prime catcher. Keeping track of these is going to be really important in a number of matchups where we are having to go through multi-prize threats that might be sat on your opponent's board. But because we can play a single prize game so well, we can utilize the counter catcher in many situations. Forcing the opponent down to one, knowing that we can take a two prize knockout to close out the game is something you will do in a number of situations. The Penny is one of the sort of more standout cards, but I have really enjoyed it in my playtesting. It can undo a lot of damage against Lost Zone Box and Lost Giratina, and if you respect those matchups, I think the Penny's worth keeping. It also does give you that little bit of extra protection against the controlling matchups. If a Greninja is ever forced into play, if you can't discard it, or if they have used a Mantine or something, you can Penny that Pokemon back up, then maybe Ultra Ball it or Vessel it immediately away into the discard pile, making it difficult for them to Ericas it back onto the board. It also can sort of bait your opponent or fix your prize map if you have started a Mooney X or if it's put into play at some point in the game and you can remove that threat from play. The opponent may not always expect that. 
and it can get you back into that one prize board state to again look towards counter catcher plays or just have a better time of things. I think the main tech considerations I have right now is Temple of Sinnoh, which can certainly help out against the Lugia matchup, which is one of your trickier ones. We'll come on to that in a moment, but also can help against Mist Energy if it's being teched into Charizard lists or Pidgeot controlling decks. It can allow you to get that Frenzied Gouge off. It also is a great way around a sort of Noivern EX checkmate, which can be done in the control Pidgeot decks as well. Because with only one Prime Catcher, one Boss's Orders, it's really hard to finagle your way around that Noivern. Then the only thing that sort of makes me feel a little bit naked in the deck is having no hand disruption whatsoever. I think Rock's Hand suits the deck that little bit better than having Iono, because at the end of the day, a lot of our end game comes with big combos that we want to try and construct. So putting ourselves back into that high hand size does seem quite useful. And because we already have eight supporters, which can help us out in the opening turns, I don't feel too bad not having an extra Iono in the deck list, which could be used just to save us with dead hands in the openings. I think because this deck has been established and is now known, playing a hand disruptor could catch many opponents off guard because they may not expect any of them within the list. Looking at the matchups then, obviously this is still a budding new archetype. So we don't have a huge amount of data. We're still sort of in the tens and twenties of games rather than in the hundreds of games played in many of these matchups. But the main sort of bad matchup is that Lugia, again, Miss Energy being a big reason why they're going to make life difficult for your frenzied gouging plays. They have collapsed stadiums that can get rid of damaged Lugias and such. They also have a number of single prize threats with their own Snorlax and Chinchino to sort of fight that fight against you and go toe to toe. So that's very reasonable for being one of your lower win rate matchups. Charizard and Lost Tina, obviously these are going to be hand disrupting based decks. So you do need to find big combo pieces towards the latter stages of games. This is mostly going to come down to how well you can keep your Dun Spars engine towards the later stages because it's very often that you're going to have efficient attacks into them in the opening stages of the game so it's likely you're going to be relatively ahead or at least toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in a prize race and it's going to come down to their hand disruption versus you deduncing your way back into enough cards to get that final combo going whether it's requiring Sada, Gust Effects or having a Dark Patch combo to get your EX up in one turn. Some of the bigger boasts for the deck having a good Chen Pao matchup they really don't have many efficient attackers into you in any which way. Gardevoir similar story you have very efficient single prize Pokemon that can even reach into their Gardevoir EX thanks to weakness. And Lost Zone Box really lacks many good answer Pokemon. Some of their answers come in the form of multi-prizes, which then allows you to use Roaring Moon EX, and then they probably have to gouge your Roaring Moon EX because of your annoying hit points, especially with a booster capsule. Things are just very rough for the Lost Zone players. And because we just have so many good attacking Pokemon and a Dunsparce can't be trapped, we also have a pretty good time into Snorlax control. Let me know your thoughts on the deck and enjoy the games. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. So getting into our first game we have a pretty nice start with the roaring moon we have artisan and greninja to start throwing some darkness energy into the bin which is nice looks like we're up against charizard which is obviously very popular right now post euic and they actually start the radzard which is kind of the chunkiest one prize that they have at their disposal which is probably going to slow down our early game fletching pressure unless we can find some gust uh, but regardless the hand is good for us to at least get established on board and that's what we're going to have a look at first. Going to get some d uh, dunts in here. Going to get a couple of them. Also going to trek. We can throw away Roaring Moon pretty happily because we are still hunting for supporter. Earthen Vessel does open up the hand a little bit more so we can have additional dig. And we do find the Explorer. Honestly, because the um, Radzard's active anyway, I can't reach with uh, our Roaring Moon. So I may as well just have the deeper dig into the deck. I'm going to pick the double the dunts here. And with both of them in hand, I'm happy enough to commit an energy here uh, rather than hold it for Greninja next turn because it means I could draw into another Explorer and still play that next turn. And with the Ancient Booster Capsule, it's not very easy for our opponent to KO the active. They'd have to find a big combination, but they have got Arvin, Forest, and Candy Pidge, so maybe that combination can come together. They can also get a freebie of the Bidoof out, which is nice for them. And they have a few tutors that they have available to them. They can Ultra Ball and grab Charizard. Possibly a limiting factor is the retreat cost of Radzard right now. I might have a free turn here still. Because they have used um, Arvin. So they probably can't churro up the active. Possibly they could Prime Catch and take a prize on the bench. Uh, and yeah, we are seeing the... Forest Seal Stone, so this could easily be Prime Catcher. And yeah, it's going to go on to Greninja. And they're going to take a prize. Okay, so they have initiated the race quite nicely here. 
and their board is very well established. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, we do have a good amount of draw. I've ripped the Sada off the top, which is going to allow us to Artem for second moon here, most likely. Uh, I'm going to go for Dedunce first here, because I want to draw into more moon or Dedunce. Uh, but because we weren't able to, I'm just going to do the loop again here. We do find Nest Ball this time, so now I can Nest Baby Moon and go for full Sada value here. It's cool that we were able to run away twice and still throw a free retreat Pokemon into play. That's part of the combination of the deck, really. I'm just going to make a quick count for our fletching to see whether it's worth throwing a count catcher out here just to take a single prize KO, or if I think I can get close enough uh, for anything else. But we are just going to take the Bidoof here and just take one as our most efficient line. Throwing a tool on, not for health necessarily, but just to throw another ancient card into the discard pile for next turn is quite relevant now that we've taken a prize. And I have two baby moons powered up, which is pretty nice. So even if they are throwing hand disruption our way, which is pretty likely to be honest with you, uh, on this turn, we should still be pretty well set. They are going to replace the stadium as well as the Iono. They can get rid of that Rotom, which was looking like easier prizes for us. So that's a good shout. And Artisan is actually a big part of our consistency loop because we constantly have to reload our dunce, of course. We do see a Lost Vacuum. I guess it's a minus 10 for us for them to get rid of it. So it does make some sense, even though they didn't need it for damage. And the hand's not looking too hot. The Sada does help out a little bit. Um, I'm going to rod back some Baby Moon here in addition to uh, Radiant Greninja. And then we're going to draw with Dunce first. Do draw Artem, which is pretty important here. Do have Trekking Shoes as well. I'm going to quickly Artem out another Baby Moon. And then we're going to Shoe. And we find the Dunce, so that's actually worked out pretty nicely. Certainly an argument for me there to Shoe first for better odds of just hitting any of those basics. I did want multiple of them. But fortunately, that has come together quite nicely. I can once again draw with Greninja now as well. Re-establish a hand quite well off of that Iono to five. And just having a look at how many ancient cards are in the discard pile. Whether it's worth me playing out this booster, which we eventually do go for. I can Fletch for 140. And that's a pretty decent chunk, to be honest with you. Um, I only need... Uh, was it 12 in the discard pile for next turn? Possibly two more going in the discard pile if they KO the active. Maybe an argument for them to use Pidgeot to Gust instead this turn to make it a little bit more tricky for us. But I'm holding on to Explorer, so and I have Dunce Draw, so there's a lot that could go right for me here. We are a little bit behind in the prize race, but we can bring it back with the amount of multi prizes the opponent has on board. And the fact that we're sort of getting on stronger later on. They are going to go for the boss play. I think this is f certainly good for the engine, but also just stopping me getting two, three more ancient cards in the uh, in the bin. So we do have a little bit more work to do now. As we're having a quick look through what resources remain. I'm going to get a quick Greninja in. Vessel's pretty handy. It's an extra ancient card I can play as I'm tossing up the damage here. Going to Trekking Shoe... Not going to take Dunce. We draw another Vessel, which actually really helps out our odds here. I can throw away an Explorer's Guidance. There's Boss as well, which is a bit important, possibly. I still have Prime. I have used Counter, though, so maybe I need to keep Boss here. Yeah, that was the debate. And I think with the Vessels, I can Vessel away Roaring Moon, and then I can play the other Vessel. Um... And that should get me to the total that I'm looking for here. Just once again, double checking. I don't have many easy uh, discards. I need 10 more damage. Possibly it's just Dark Patch that goes here as my weakest card. Yeah, it's not something I want to get rid of because it is going to be important for me to burst a big moon into play, probably in the later stages of this game, to take a two prize knockout when the opponent goes down to one. Um... But we still have so many of these dark patches around. And we only have five cards in deck, don't forget. So we've really filtered the deck quite nicely to a critical mass of, like, Prime Catcher, Sardas, Dark Patches, Dunsparce Pieces, and Big Moons is essentially all we need now. 
Um, it's looking like the opponent's coming in with Radzard. I don't really think that's the right shout, because I want to take one prize anyway next turn, most likely. Uh, so I feel like they should be using a big Zard here, rather than Radzard. I think that actually just helps our map. Either way, I had boss in hand, and because they were bossing our Dunsparce, I could just have had boss anyway on this turn. So I don't think it's a massive difference. Uh, but now I can Sada and go down to one card in deck. The only thing about playing Sada is um, I want Sada to be part of my end game because it's one of the best ways to load up um, a big moon. And you can see the deck. There really aren't many cards there now, but I still can play a Sada if I really want to. The best thing I could do is just attach a... Uh, Ancient Booster Capsule, but that's actually the bottom card in our deck, so I can't free myself of that card. What we can do is just establish the dunce, at least, and go down to two. Much better to go to two than to one, obviously, because the opponent is likely going to go for Iono. But we do have our work cut out for us a little bit. If they can reload Radzard here, it would be very powerful um, to take a KO with, another, with a one prizer once again and force me to have Prime Catcher in addition to Sada Patches. Um, but we're holding our entire deck, basically. The only card in deck right now is the, uh, is the booster. Definitely was questionable to play the Sada last turn, though. I think having the extra out for Sada was kind of nice. It also depends on our prizes. If I had any Dark Energy prize, it was okay to Sada, because then I could have, like, Attachment, uh, Explorer double patch as a way to win. The opponent has been able to Iono and reload the Zard, so they've done everything they can. So it does force a lot from us. We'll have six cards in deck with Dedunce drawing us down three deeper. Prime Catch is a big piece for us. Uh, are we there with Baby Moon just yet? Having a quick look at our math, or do I need Big Moon to close things out here? They did collapse the Rotom, obviously. So it's likely that I will require... Um, oh, I shouldn't have played this Artisan, right? I probably should have... I should have just Dunced first. I think I was just doing this to check my deck. Uh, but if I dunce now and then draw the Sada, okay, yeah. So we do draw the Sada, but now I could have artisaned out a dunce, and then my bottom deck would have to be Dark Patch. Now that could be bottom two, but we get fortunate there. Um, definitely a little missequence of just not knowing what was in my deck, because I wasn't really paying enough attention. Uh, but yeah, we were able to get over the line with the Sada Dark Patch plays with the Moony X. It doesn't always come together, um, especially because Sada's like a big part of your draw. In that case, we only had one dunce available, so it didn't feel that comfortable. Often in these sorts of situations, you'll look to have multiple dunce to push yourself over the line. But anyway, we're getting into the next game. We're up against what looks like either Lost Box or uh, Tina right now. I'm going to see some Confei action. Spiritomb's in play for them. I'm going to start with some selects, and it's uh, Lost Tina. Okay. We straight away have a pretty nice Vessel play. Can go Dark for Dark, because again, that's always part of our early game strats to throw some Dark Energy in the bin for our Sada draw as well as our um, Dark Patch plays. Looks like I wasn't able to explore it into a Dark Patch. That would have been our only way of attacking this turn. So it looks like we're going to just end on a sort of developing turn, I suppose. I've already got rid of one Roxanne into the Lost Zone, which is kind of nice for us. I'm just going to try and protect this dunce as best I can and pass things over. And then I'm going to have Sada for next turn to draw some cards and dunce as well. They only have two in the Lost Zone, so it's hard for them to gate this turn unless they have a Lost Vacuum. So yeah, it is looking likely that it's going to be a Cram Swing, if anything, from them. The Spirit Team lead might be making their board state a little bit weird as well. They may not have room for like Greninja and extra Tina pieces, which kind of are like their chunkiest dudes, but they do fall off quite hard. I feel like the opponent's going to attempt to be one prize in the matchup. But the, uh, the Penny could help us out in that regard if they're trying to set up Greninja and Sable plays down the line. Yeah, so they are going to fill their board with Rad Greninja, probably their highest damage output option in the matchup, unless they're going through big moons. 
So we see the chorus, we see the Greninja, there's uh, the board to just go into cram possibly. Yep, just going to be a swing with Spit Innocently here. Water onto Greninja, so that shows their intent pretty clearly. On 10 into the 90 from Shuriken does line up quite nicely. Uh, we have the Artisan, going to grab another Moon because we want to get full Sada value here straight away. Uh, we're going to play Shoes probably first here. Ideally I can... Oh, yeah, nice. So we draw second to Dunce. This is a really good board to sit on, honestly, because I'm very happy with my next turn. And by doing this, we basically force their next turn into Greninja hitting both Moon rather than taking out like Moon and Dunce, which would have been their best option had we not evolved. But because the Runaway ability obviously removes that damage from us, they really can't touch this engine right now, which is going to be pretty handy. I feel like for them it's going to be a mission of firstly get to 10 so they can unlock Sableye as an extra attacker, but maybe just like reload Cram this turn or yeah, get a swing with Greninja in is still probably their best play here. But the 140 threshold and especially the 200 threshold with our booster capsules is just so frustrating for them to deal with. Nothing's that efficient into us. Which is kind of one of the boasts of the matchup really and the deck in general. The Tina is likely going to be in that top popularity definitely in the sort of top five of decks i would say gonna see some flower selectings the greninja is raring to go so he's gonna try and punch into double moon here right there is the sableye coming in as well so they're pretty well established And it's going to be Shuriken, as expected. So they can level up the prize race and start threatening this baby moon. We have plenty to fletch through him next turn. Sada's off the top, which is going to improve our turn. I can just, again, reload moons. <laughs> I think the only thing that I need to be slightly concerned about is... Um, finding Rod, I suppose. We vessel into a ton of uh, more energy and vessel here. I think I, again, just want to stick to the plan and just keep my dunce around on board, honestly. If I can keep them both for another potential Iona or Roxanne turn, we're going to be in good shape. We weren't able to find any health buffing tools, so there could be some sneaky Sableye play coming in here. Reloading a Greninja could be strong as well. Gate yeah, actually fails, which is weird. Uh, but they do have attachment to Sableye anyway. And then Chorus. Strange sequence to throw away a gate there. <laughs> There's Tina going into V-Star, which would force a gouging, which is much better than us swinging with Calamity Storm for them, right? So I'd basically, again, have to use the Moon as, like, that last end game play. I don't really want to put it into play at any point before then. Unless I'm ahead enough in a prize race where I can be allowed to do that. They're going to select and then go into the Sableye. They are actually just going to reload as well quickly. With the rod. I don't think you will see anything too creative here. Just 50 to the active. The rest to the other moon I would expect. Any damage they put onto Dedunce. I can remove. Unless they just want to bait the Dedunce out. Maybe put 20 onto each of the Dedunce. Could be a play. Just to make me do it into a Roxanne. You know that sort of thing. Because they're pretty low into their deck now as well. They're going to just reload the cram on the bench, which is fine. Uh, they replace Artisan, which is also just fine. <laughs> A little bit of disruption. And yeah, as expected, they're going to go through the active and just put the rest on the baby moon. So the one thing we need to dig for here is Super Rod, I think. And I also don't want to put any um, 
Dunsparce into play because it plays into Sable Greninja stuff. Uh, possibility for me to just take shoes here and not need the dark patch. Just to again dig towards that rod, which is kind of the only thing that's hurting me right now. So much so that I'm also going to do some runaways here. We're at nine cards in deck. Looking for a one-off, obviously. Uh, but there is the super rod, so that's going to allow us to get these moons back, which is pretty important to just keep this chain up and healthy for our opponent to possibly hand disrupt us next turn. We're going to throw an ancient booster on, so the opponent can't do a Greninja two prize turn at least. And we're just going to grab another moon here. Mostly wanting, if we are getting hit with Iono, to draw into more Dunce pieces towards the bottom of the deck. Uh, and obviously we don't want to put two Dunce Bars down this turn, because that would open up the Greninja 2 prize turn back for them. So, trying to keep the chunky 1 prize board state to give them, again, no real great plays. Only slight concern is how many patch we've been through early. I think there's two in the discard pile at least. So it might be difficult for me to get a moon all in one turn. Obviously manual attachment can help me get there as well. But I think we've been through a few at the stage. The deck's looking pretty thin. The opponent's continuing to select here. Do they have a better play than just swing with cram? Swing with cram sounds terrible. V-star power through the active doesn't sound great. But it could be a play for them. Hope to be pretty chunky. Again, using uh, Greninja could be their best play here for in terms of like raw damage on board. Do you see the chorus? They're going to the bottom of the deck as well. We're both in a very similar situation <laughs> where we don't play Hand Disruption. Well, they play a Hand Disruptor, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, and there is a rocks in their lost zone. Some lists only play one, some do play two rocks. Like pre-rotation days. But no hand disruption for us is probably pretty good news. I mean, I'm sat on Sada, which always looks pretty strong. We do see Greninja. Do you see attachments? And is it a cram play? Oh, it sounds terrible to cram me. Uh, they've got prime at least, so they can KO dunce. Oh, they're going for a trapping play. This is so bad into Penny. <laughs> the Penny looks really good here. It's just free. It's a free swing for us. So the debate really is just whether or not to Prime Catcher versus Penny here, but I think Penny is just too good value, to be honest with you. I'm holding on to Sada Patch Attach for next turn. So I can use Big Moon pretty happily. I may just pre-bench a Big Moon here, uh, because our prize situation is looking pretty handy. I could bench both of them, honestly. Uh, but that does lock me into finding stuff, and if we do full brick... I may not want to put the other one down. I think just one is fine here. Give me a bit of protection against rocks. Because I'm still expecting it, honestly. Because I think that's the only thing that can beat us at this stage. A rock sand that really slows us down. But the penny buying us a free turn is absolutely massive. There's so many prizes behind now. So many attacks behind. Even if they go Greninja on Dunce. Like, if they have Vacuum and can KO the active, it would be okay. Otherwise, it's looking pretty poor. They've gone down to the bottom of their deck, but they do obviously still have Rods. There is a Rod. Let's see. Did they attempt another trapping play here with Counter Catcher, perhaps? Um, or they could Roxanne back into deck as well to not deck out. It's another option. Do you see great, uh, Gate? So Greninja's getting into the mix again. Just 
Just the one grass. Turn attachment of water. So that's ready to go. Uh, and they do have Roxanne, so that's kind of the best thing they can do. We do pretty nicely off it, though. That's two pieces of our four-piece combo to win next turn. And at the very least, it means I can swing again with a Baby Moon next turn, so... That's looking good. They will be removing this Dunsparce, right? Guaranteed. Don't know where the rest of this damage goes. Maybe on Big Moon, honestly, so I can't gouge for win? Oh, it just goes active. Okay. Uh, well, let's start with the Sarda. No reason not to. It's our main draw here. And, wow, we actually uh, kind of high-rolled. We got Prime Catcher and uh, the uh, Dark Patch off the three. So, yeah, pretty nice to close the game then and there. Um, even if we don't there, I can just swing with two moons and be in pretty, pretty good shape. <laughs> so we got pretty far ahead of the Tina there. Let's get into game number three. The hand is pretty okay, lacking much supporter draw. I guess I have draw from Rad Greninja again. I'm up against Future. Um, definitely an argument to play some of this ball search out first, and I think that's what we are going to go for here. <clears throat> We're going to keep Dark Patch off the trek. And we're going to toss a moon and then grab Greninja and get to drawing. Uh, so using a baby moon in the active is weak to the opponent uh, hitting from generators. So I do just leave the Dunsparce active and it's because we have a very specific hand now. I'm holding a hand with Countercatcher Dark Patch Energy, so I can... I'm basically trying to bait out these crowns coming into play. They actually didn't need the crowns because they hit the uh, tool there pre-research, but they still have developed their board pretty fully here. Possibly a mistake from them. If they held all the crowns here, we'd be in a lot worse situation. But because they have played crowns onto this board, I have a two-prize response KO. And ultimately, that's what this matchup comes down to. I need to be taking two every turn. I know they have means of taking two in most turns. We did take the risk with uh, Greninja there to make our hand a bit better than just the safe Dark Patch um, counter catch play. You'll see I only did the one because I wanted to still have the patch line open. But now I've started into counter catcher and Prime Catcher, which is pretty wild, actually. Um... So I have this turn basically lined up over a number of turns. Like I have this turn as a repeat next turn, basically. Does that make sense? I can counter catch KO the crown. And even if they take a two prize KO with hands, I can do prime catch a KO crown again next turn. Um, and then we have Big Moon finishing the game like beyond that point onto a hands. So, yeah, like, our, our three attack map is going pretty nicely because I've drawn into counter and prime. We had counter from turn one, right? So we knew that we were looking towards that for our turn two play. Uh, and we know that the Maridon basically always has to attack, right? It's very rare that they can get enough generators to get a turn one amp uh, with enough crowns to take the first two prize KO. As it happens, they're going into the 220 on the moon, which makes very little sense, honestly. I feel like the, if they had Prime Catcher, they had to just take out Dunce again and go back onto even prizes with them right on. Not sure why they've done this swing into Big Moon. Maybe they they know they're behind enough that they need to, like, get back into the game somehow with a play like this. But I already had the Prime Catcher. It would also get punished pretty heavily by Penny, so... Uh, even if they did take a two-prize KO, like, with a hands with a tool on, I'm just always ahead in the race here, right? I'm holding on to boss now. I've got dark patch for next turn. I have all the options, so... Our three attack game plan is really going nicely because we set up that counter catcher play from turn one. 
Uh, and again, we look very far ahead because they swung into a moon, but the prize race honestly doesn't matter for them. Like, they can take the two here and they win next turn with this damaged moon KO, but I'm already at two. And I have so many ways of winning here. I can do the boss play uh, on the three crowns that you put down, or, or I could just set up a big moon there. Uh, I do think the matchup's kind of tricky, and you need to really have a lot to tempo out on them. Um, but it can be done, and gouging at least is very good at getting around baton, so that's a big part of the matchup. And your hit points against, like, uh, Roaring Moon's hit points, EX's hit points against uh, hands can be very annoying, especially if you are targeting those crowns early. Like, Calamity Storming Crown is, is very good as well with your high hit points with Booster Capsule. It forces a lot from them. So I do think the matchup's winnable. You just need to have a high tempo game plan against them. Getting into our last game, we don't have that good of a start. We have uh, a Trekking Shoe, which doesn't do too much, uh, but it does get us into Dunsparce and the Dunce for next turn. So just going to pass things over. It looks like we're up against another Charizard. They've got the double Charmander, and they're just going to instant charge up. Seems pretty reasonable. We're going to dunce first hit. Trying to get more value from this Sada, but we've just drawn into even more supporters. And with that in mind, I really don't want to do much else with the hand. So we'll just Guidance here. Maybe an argument is just getting a turn attachment. I already have the Vessel... Gets rid of a lot of our darkness energy. Yeah, we are just going to throw a ton of energy into the bin. Uh, and just take Greninja possibly here. From the Nest Ball. Yeah, just going to draw more with Greninja. We do get that Dunsparce, which is looking pretty nice for next turn. Uh, but we basically take a turn off. And the opponent has been able to Arvin. So they can get Forest Candy. So they are going to be swinging with a... Zard here, which is pretty scary. I'll start really not the best, but next turn I can at the very least go Sardar attach swing with Storm. They're only hitting us for 180, right? So it's not too bad for us to, as long as we find a stadium, Calamity Storm for a decent chunk into this Charizard. Then the Forest Hill Stone to start establishing their engine Pokemon, Bidoof and Pidge. Makes sense. And yeah, they are going to get the early swing in, which is certainly scary. Like, oftentimes we want to be the tempo deck, right? But in this case, it's not worked out that way. I think we're going to have to start with Greninja, maybe use the Stun Sparse. Okay, we do hit a couple basics, which makes me a lot more comfortable about using this to dunce this turn, possibly. We can do the Sada Draw first. Because uh, now our mission is, thanks to Stadium, I can swing 220 here, and then I need to get to 110 next turn, right? Sorry, 220 this turn. And then we can finish off this Charizard two shot with a baby moon. And then I'm hoping that my board just remains one prize until I need to use another big moon at the end game. That's typically always our route. Uh, we get to a point where our moons can KO certainly the Rotom if they're not able to get rid of it. Maybe a Pidgeot. And then a big moon can get rid of a Charizard EX for them. Uh, but we are going to be behind in a prize race for a little bit of this game. Or at least, like, leveling up things for a while. But we can deal with this. The opponent has the broken Bib plus Pidge engine developed, so they can basically do whatever they want to every turn. And immediately they're going to get rid of that Rotom, which, one of, which was one of our easiest targets, and that's been removed quite quickly. Uh, picking up Rod's actually pretty massive here. Getting back Baby Moon seems pretty good. Getting back a Dunsparce piece seems good as well. Maybe I don't need it just yet, but going to be pretty handy later on. Let's just have more access to these Dunts. Um, could possibly Greninja draw. Could also just get a turn attachment in, possibly. I don't need too much else, though, right? Um, do I have enough Ancient cards in the bin to just swing here? I think I must. Yeah, we got 150. That's plenty to fletch through. Level things up. We have the double dunce on board. So I'm pretty safeguarded around hand disruption here. Would be a bit scary to see two Sardis hit the bottom of the deck though. But I don't necessarily need one next turn. I have an energy banked. 
on the bench. As the opponent's going to get rid of some of their tech Pokemon in favor of a Charizard. I'm going to see Rod, most likely getting some energy back in. Yep, just three fire. Unsurprisingly, they're loading up the big boy. They're also going to boss a Dedunce. Bibbing up. And they're going to take out a Dedunce. Uh, I really don't need to go into a Dedunce, right? I think I'm pretty okay to... Oh wow, here we go. We're, we're cashing in on Big Moon now while we have the hand, knowing that it's just so intimidating to um, need combo to close the game on a following turn. So we're just going to rip the Sardar while we have it and then just develop Dunce again. And then we'll be going down to two. And I can win next turn, obviously, by just taking out Pidgeot again. I'm going to play one of these patches. Maybe one of those patches was a bit greedy, actually, to play the second patch there. Probably should have been held, honestly, because I think that's a big combo piece for me. Um, but they can go down to one by taking this guy out with either this Charmander or Radzard or whatever whilst hand disrupting. And I'm really hoping that just Dunce, Greninja, and Sada Draws can see us over the line. Maybe the big moon there was a little bit greedy, honestly. But I think I wasn't getting it done unless I uh, took the two there. Okay, the Iono is fairly kind. Roaring Rooney X is one of the pieces. Trekking Shoes is obviously very good. Um, and I have Dunce Draw, don't forget. They've retreated, they've evolved into Charizard EX, which is a really bad choice <laughs> because I can just gouge again here. They definitely should attack with a one prizer there. Drawing Dunsmas is our worst draw in the deck because it was free from Artisan, but I suppose I can get this one that I'm putting back into the deck out again. Uh, yeah, we're going to get the free Dunce. And I have another. Well, first we're going to do the Trekking Shoe. Don't need Boss now. Would have needed Prime Catcher as well as everything else here. Oh, but there's Vessel Sada Patch. That should be game as long as I have enough energy in the deck. Yeah, we do. Uh, we would have had five draws for Prime Catcher of a 13-card deck uh, if they'd swung correctly into a baby here. That's I think that's why I'm Greninja drawing, just to see if we would have got there, <laughs> which we totally wouldn't have. Um... But yeah, fortunate to have beaten the second Charizard. I don't think the matchup's easy, but the fact that they took the tempo and took that early prize lead against us made things a little bit dicier. Um, and possibly me gouging was a bit greedy there. Maybe I could have stuck with one prizes for a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why they didn't end on a Radzard or a baby Charmander hit. But yeah, those are the games. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, let me know what you think about the archetype. I certainly think it's real and a lot of fun to play. And has cool sequencing puzzles. You can see I was making like a couple mistakes throughout the video. And that's because I'm still getting to grips with the whole draw three, then put things back into the deck, then fish things out. Which is like logically a strange thing to think about when you're trying to improve your odds for stuff. Especially when there's Ionos and stuff in the mix as well in terms of like what was placed at the bottom versus where you want them. Uh, so there's a lot of intricacy around the deck actually and a very cool engine. So hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you tomorrow for another one. Cheers.